welcome to Festival ASEAN Edition webinar um, for Philippines market, carving out new markets in Philippines. Good afternoon, Dr. Emmanuel R. Fernandez, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Good day to you. Welcome to our webinar on Philippines carving out new markets in Philippines. Festival is a SBF created virtual space where businesses can access country specific webinars, connect with potential partners and distributors overseas via virtual business matching sessions and access special reports from our industry partners and expert speakers. Today's webinar titled Carving Out New Markets in the Philippines is a timely reminder for us to look forward beyond the current challenges to the emerging trends and opportunities opening up businesses in our region. In the recent speech given by the President of the Philippines in Singapore in September 2022, President Marcos stated that the Philippines is, a, is a Asia's fastest rising star and the country is expecting a strong recovery from the pan pandemic. The Philippines' new economic regime would prioritize these essential initiatives, jobs creation, enhance the digital infrastructure, facilitation of research and development through continuous uh, infrastructure investment through PP and human capital development, focus on agriculture for economic expansion and food security, rejuvenate the tourism industry, and introducing tax incentives. At SBF, we look, always look forward to collaborating with our counterpart at the Embassy of the Philippines and the respective government agencies and PACs. We are making every effort to, to develop and curate internationalization programs suitable for Singapore companies. Digitalization has generated numerous possibilities. Since the onset COVID pandemic a few years ago, digital investment has increased across most industries. This trend is expected to continue. And I'm pleased that today's webinar will feature a presentation from the Philippines given by the experts in, the, in their respective fields who will provide valuable insights to the, to the opportunities in the Philippines. We have speakers, we have the so-called keynote that is uh, so-called coming from uh, Dr. Emmanuel uh, R. Fernandez, and we have um, the next speaker from uh, Convera, Mr. Edward. We have Ms. Carla, uh, commercial counselor in the Philippines Trade and uh, Investment Center in Singapore. We have Mr. Romeo M. Montenegro, Assistant Je Secretary, Deputy Executive Director for Mindanao Development Authorities, as well as uh, Ms. Laurie Beth, a uh, professional lawyer, as well as Ms. Erika Tan from SBF FTA. I'm looking forward to the insights from our speakers on the various opportunities in the Philippines as well as incentives that's provided by the Philippines Authority. Before we proceed to our main program today, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to our partners for this webinar. Today's webinar will not be possible without the strong support from our distinguished speakers as well as Enterprise Singapore, whom we work closely with to support our businesses, as well as our principal partner, Convera. Ladies and gentlemen, without further delay, I wish you a good webinar ahead. Let's start the webinar. And uh, let me just introduce the first speaker, which, uh, okay, so before that, sorry, let me just do this, okay, yeah. You do a poll first, so sorry, yeah. Anybody who is uh, interested in the Overseas Market Workshop next year, uh, please you know, sign up for the poll. We will come back to you and we will probably give you more information on that. Right. Okay, yes. Let me just do a summary of this. In, in the summary of uh, with Global Connect SBF, Singapore businesses can learn with us about markets, new customers, and free trade agreement. Learn with us through our dedicated digital spaces, established networks, and, and hands-on advice and facilitation. 
localize with, with us through our trusted relationship abroad and deepen your presence and secure long-term sustainability. These slides will be shared with you after this event so you can refer to a summary for our services here. Please scan the QR code or visit Global Co at Connect, Global Connect at SBF for more. Learn, learn, localize. Okay. This is a poll for everyone who is interested to explore further with uh, SPF. Let me just introduce the keynote speaker for today, Dr. Emmanuel R. Fernandez, Deputy Head of Mission and Council General, Embassy of the Republic of Singapore, uh, Republic of the Philippines in Singapore. Dr. Emmanuel is a career diplomat currently serving as a Deputy Head of Mission and Council General in Singapore. He has previously served as Deputy Secretary General and Executive Director of the Department of Foreign Affairs, Maritime and Ocean Affairs Office, as well as Acting Assistant Secretary, Secretary General and Executive Director for DFA's Office of Strategic Communication and Research. Uh, today's uh, keynote by Dr. Emmanuel is on the recording. We'll play his video right now. First of all, allow me to extend my appreciation to the Singapore Business Federation for once again hosting a webinar spotlighting the Philippines. In last year's ASEAN edition of SBF's FYI Festival, which focused on the Philippines, the Philippine Embassy joined the panel of speakers to present trade and investment opportunities before nearly 300 participating multinational and Singapore-based companies. We are happy to be taking part in this year's edition once again. Singapore has consistently been a major trading partner and one of the top sources of foreign direct investments for the Philippines. In the state visit of President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. last September, he emphasized that the Philippines and Singapore enjoy a strong, stable, and wide-ranging partnership. Our bilateral relations, which has spanned 53 years, provide a solid foundation for even stronger economic relations. The current Philippine administration is committed to ensuring an even more robust cooperation between Singapore and the Philippines. Thus, I am very pleased to be opening this afternoon's discussions on the Philippine business climate and the advantages and opportunities that it offers. From 2017 to 2021, the Philippines' annual FDI average grew to 9.2 billion US dollars. Singapore was a top FDI source at 761 million US dollars. Singapore investments include major projects in te telecommunications towers, fiber optics, and renewable energy. In 2021, Philippine startups raised over 1 billion US dollars in funding with fintech and e-commerce startups driving majority of the deals. The pandemic was a catalyst for transforming the Philippine startup ecosystem. Investors on the ground have likewise given feedback that the Philippine valuations are among the most attractive in ASEAN. In our President's first State of the Nation address last July 25, he also announced that we are poised to bring in more productivity-enhancing investments and strategic industries such as energy, high-tech manufacturing, health and medical care, and all emerging technologies. I will no longer go into much detail as these developments would also be tackled by our speakers for today. But before I turn over the floor to the next speaker, 
May I reiterate our president's call during his state visit to Singapore when he met with Singapore business leaders? I would like to reiterate his invitation for Singapore business businesses to partner with us in our pursuit of growth and development in the Philippines. Let me close by once again thanking you all for your time and your keen interest in the Philippines. Salamat at mabuhay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Emmanuel. Um, we have our next speakers. We have next speaker from Compera, Mr. Edward Kanan. Navigating currency volatility with confidence. Mr. Edward is a corporate hedging manager rapid uh, in um, Convera with more than 20 years' experience in global market spending, roles in Melbourne, London, and Singapore. Edward draws on his extensive knowledge of FX markets to assist clients with their FX risk management needs via a range of solutions from that Convera offers. Over to you, Edward. Thank you, Teklo. Uh, thank you everyone for joining today and also to SBF for having me here as a panelist. So for the next 15 minutes or so, I'll be presenting on navigating currency vol volatility with confidence. And with all the volatility that we're seeing in global financial markets at the moment, there probably couldn't be a more pr appropriate time to be addressing this particular topic. Please move on. So firstly, a little bit about Convera. Uh, formerly, we were uh, Western Union Business Solutions, the arm of Western Union that uh, spoke to uh, corporate customers. Uh, and we were bought over by a US private equity consortium around 12 months ago. Uh, we're the world's largest non-bank payments company, having operations in over 200 countries and offering solutions for more than 140 different currencies. Our primary focus is to deliver smarter money movements and solutions to our customers to help them maximize value. Uh, and our customer base includes some of the fastest growing segments, including but not limited to financial institutions, more than 700 universities globally, law firms and non-government organizations. Next slide, please. So why do businesses find managing foreign exchange difficult? Well, firstly, foreign exchange is volatile. It may not get the same number of headlines that stock markets get in terms of ongoing volatility, but nonetheless, FX is a very volatile sector of financial markets. If we just consider the Singapore dollar against the US dollar, the average range that this currency pair has exhibited since 1983 has been 8.4% uh, over the course of a 12 month period. For other currencies such as the euro and Japanese yen, it's been even more volatile with those two currency pairs showing 11.2% and a 15.4% average range over the course of the year respectively. Now, secondly, foreign exchange is driven by uh, many factors, including global growth, global trade, and most importantly, monetary policy expectations that are rolled out by central banks globally. Foreign exchange moves are often sharp and sudden, therefore making them very unpredictable. And lastly, it's important to be aware that uh, large moves within foreign exchange markets will typically occur outside of the Asian uh, trading time. So if we look at, uh, for example, the US dollar against the Singapore dollar uh, from nine o'clock till five o'clock Singapore time, we're not going to see a huge amount of movement on most days, but overnight in the European and US time zones, that's when we see uh, much more volatility. So I'll now move on uh, to some FX forecasts, focusing in particular on the Singapore dollar uh, and the Philippine peso. So in terms of key themes for the next six to 12 months, firstly, in Inflation has been a problem, as we're all aware, uh, for the past six to eight months globally. It started in the US, but that's spread to the rest of the world for a number of reasons. Now, commodity prices, in particular oil prices, have started to fall, uh, but wage pressures do remain, which will be an ongoing cost constraint for businesses going forward into 2023. Supply chains uh, and in 
in uh, result, trading costs uh, remain a problem. The supply chain issues started with the pandemic, uh, in particular with bottlenecks uh, in global ports, driving up shipping costs. But more recently, supply chain issues have been exacerbated by the problems in Ukraine. We've seen demand ease from the consumer side. So people are spending less now. After the pandemic, uh, we saw a lot of consumers have pent up demand because savings rates were much higher during the pandemic. That's driven up spending from most of last year into this year, but that has now started to ease with higher interest rates, uh, calming demand uh, and also inflation. Uh, and lastly, the global rate hiking cycle that's been underway by most central banks this year is likely to be sharp but short. So we have seen sharp rate increases. One such example is the Federal Reserve in the US. In their last three meetings over the past few months, they've increased interest rates by 75 basis points at each of those meetings. Uh, they're likely to increase again in December, but there's talk about or what's priced into markets for next year is possibly rate cuts uh, by the second half of next year. But that remains to be seen. And therefore, there's a lot of not unknown, not in only in interest rate markets, but in currency markets. Next slide, please. So in terms of the possibilities uh, for next year for the US dollar against the Singapore dollar, Whilst we have a base case in scenario two, I'll go through shortly. I'll start with this green area up here, uh, which is scenario one. And this uh, represents the possibility of a much stronger US dollar next year. So in terms of what could cause that, if the Federal Reserve in the US need to be much more aggressive in terms of what's priced in for interest rate increases. So if, if inflation remains high and they have to keep increasing interest rates through Q Q1 and Q2 next year, then that would likely be very supportive for the US dollar uh, due to the higher interest rates there. It would also ultimately very likely result in a global recession because once interest rates get too high and consumer demand gets completely uh, killed off, then that typically would result in a recession such as what we saw back in 2008, obviously for different reasons. During periods of global recessions and stock market uncertainty, there's always a flight to safety in currency markets. And the biggest safe haven in currency markets is the US dollar. So if that scenario did play out with much more aggressive interest rate increases in the US, we'd likely see the US dollar uh, move back up towards that 1.45 level against the Singapore dollar. Now, scenario two, this gray area, is our most likely uh, case. That's our in-house view. And what we're forecasting for the next 12 months is for the US dollar to moderate against the Singapore dollar to move gradually lower over the course of the next 12 months. Now, this is on the back of the view that global growth will continue to slow, but easing inflation pressures uh, will cause the Federal Reserve to pause their interest rate increases early next year. We also see the chances of supply chain pressures uh, easing uh, being very good, uh, in particular, if China, China continue to come out of lockdowns, uh, and that should help improve global risk sentiment. So in that case, where there's less demand for the safe haven US dollar and interest rates aren't moving up as quickly in the US, that would result in the US dollar gradually depreciating. Now, scenario three, this red area down here, that's a case where the US dollar is significantly lower. Now, to have this happen, for the US dollar against the Singapore dollar to move down to, say, 1.25 or 1.2 over the next 12 months, we'd need to see a very strong global economic recovery uh, in the second half of next year. For that to happen, we'd need to see the Federal Reserve stop raising interest rates by the end of this year, and also for the conflict uh, in Russia to be resolved within the first half of next year as well. If both of those things happen, there's likely to be a very sharp rebound in stock markets and global economic growth. That would completely um, mean that there's no need for the safe haven US dollar and the US dollar against the Sing. In that scenario, although unlikely, it could cause the dollar Sing to move down to 1.2 or below. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of the Singapore dollar against the Philippine peso, 
It's interesting to note, uh, firstly, that the Philippine peso being an emerging markets currency is much more volatile than the Singapore dollar. So what that means is if the US dollar is strengthening against the Singapore dollar, it will be strengthening even more against the Philippine peso. Likewise, if the US dollar is weakening against the Singapore dollar, it's very likely going to weaken even more against the Philippine peso. So in terms of the likely outcomes or the possible outcomes, I should say, for the Sing uh, Philippine peso rate next year, we again have a base rate, scenario two, but I'll start with this green area, scenario one, where it's possible that the Singapore dollar could move much higher than current levels against the Philippine peso. And for that to happen, uh, we would again need the Federal Reserve to be hiking very aggressively through Q1 and Q2 next year. That would cause a move much higher in the US dollar, which uh, would be uh, much more against the peso than against the Singapore dollar. As mentioned on the previous slide, if the US do raise rates aggressively, that would also likely tip the world into a global recession. And during periods of a global recession, emerging markets currencies such as the Philippine peso tend to underperform. Now, our most likely scenario or our base case internally is for the Singapore dollar to remain elevated against the Philippine peso, but not to move up to any extreme levels. The reasoning for that view is that the emerging markets currencies don't fare particularly well when US interest rates remain high. So if the US Federal Reserve pause their interest rate increases in Q1 next year, but don't change interest rates for most of the year, or if they only cut rates once or twice, then that would mean that US interest rates uh, by historical standards over the past 10 years would still be relatively high. And in that scenario, the Philippine peso would remain under pressure and would likely underperform the Singapore dollar. However, if we look at scenario three, this red area here, if there's a significant global economic recovery uh, and the US Federal Reserve pause their interest rate hikes at the end of this year and start cutting interest rates by the middle of next year, that would cause a significant weakness in the US dollar, which would benefit not only the Singapore dollar, but even more so the Philippine peso. And if that scenario plays out, then we may see levels of 35 or below in the Singapore dollar against the Philippine peso rate. Now, although the peso has been weakening against the Singapore dollar uh, for the past one to two years, it's worth noting that back in 2018 and into the start of 2019, the Singapore dollar Philippine peso rate dropped 12% in a very short period of time. So although it's been a gradual grind higher in the Singapore Philippine peso rate, it's always uh, worth being mindful that this uh, particular cross in terms of the uh, Singapore dollar Philippine peso can move very sharply, very quickly. Next slide, please. So I'll now move on to uh, foreign exchange risk management. And this would typically start with a four-step process. Firstly, reviewing uh, what happened last year. If you did hedge last year, what worked well and what didn't? If you weren't hedging at all, uh, how did that impact your business if there were adverse exchange rate movements? Step two uh, is about goal setting and understanding your risk profile. So for example, we have a lot of customers that are only concerned with protecting against adverse exchange rate movements. Other customers uh, prefer to have some protection, but they want to be able to participate if foreign exchange rates move in their favor. Step three is about creating a plan. How often will you hedge? Will it be quarterly, six monthly, or possibly annually? And what type of products will you use? And of course, the products that you use will be um, tied back to your goal setting in step two. And lastly, executing the plan is of course paramount. Um, too often we have seen customers where they've had a plan in place and on what they wanted to do, but the plan hasn't actually been executed and that's cost them in the long run. And more often than not, that happens uh, because there's not enough accountability. So it's important to have someone who is in charge of executing the plan to make sure it does happen because it's no good having a foreign exchange risk management plan in place that never gets executed. 
So as an example of a rolling hedge profile, this is an example of a customer who's looked to hedge out for six months. So on the vertical axis here, we have the percentage of their requirement that's been hedged and on the horizontal axis each month out to six months. So we can see that this customer's fully hedged themselves for the first three months. In this example, it's because they've not been able to fix their prices for the products they're selling for three months. So they've fixed it to their pricing cycle. We typically see customers hedge a lot more in the next three months or so because there's a lot more visibility. Now for months four, five and six, this customer has hedged, but only 25% of their requirement. Uh, and in this example, that's because it's the start of a new pricing cycle. So whilst the customer knows that they will need to hedge, if they can move their prices to an extent in line with foreign exchange movements within that time, then there's no need to set a full hedge until the start of that pricing cycle. Next slide. So in terms of potential situations and strategies, um, firstly, a lot of customers will have some sort of natural hedge. So as an example, there's a lot of co companies in Singapore that uh, would buy their supplies in US dollars, whether that be from the US, from China, uh, or anywhere else that prices in US dollars. But they may also be receiving some of their payments from customers uh, in US dollars as well. So that would offset some of the uh, accounts payable uh, in US dollars. However, for any foreign exchange payments that aren't hedged, it's always uh, prudent to consider a risk management strategy utilizing either forwards uh, or option structures. So in terms of uh, risk management priorities for foreign exchange, it's firstly important to note that FX is volatile and unpredictable as mentioned earlier. Foreign exchange what rates won't be the same this time in one year or even one month and possibly in a week. And that's where the risk comes from. Uh, you can't bank on foreign exchange rates staying where they are or even close to where they are now. It's important to have a plan in place for managing your foreign exchange exposure to help bring predictability, not only to cash flows, but also to underlying profit margins. Making incremental and regular changes to your risk management strategy is important. This way you can take advantage of market moves uh, and also uh, adjust for changes in your business, whether that be business expansion to be able to add more hedging or possibly to reduce if there's things like shipment or project delays, which is something that we saw quite frequently throughout the pandemic. Uh, and lastly, um, foreign exchange does obviously provide a business opportunity in terms of being able to have operations offshore. However, risk management should always be the priority if you do have foreign exchange payments or receivables. So I'll now finish with just a couple of aspects of international strategy in which we have extensive experience uh, and may be able to discuss with you if necessary going forward. So we've touched on currency volatility to a large extent. So just as a takeaway here, it's important to note if you do have foreign exchange risk in your business, what would be the impact if you saw a five or a 10% move against you uh, in exchange rates and you didn't have any hedging in place? So you can always talk to us about our range of hedging products, whether that be options or forward contracts. For years, we've been helping uh, our customers mitigate their foreign exchange risk to help their profits. Climate change is going to be more and more important year in, year out. We've seen companies uh, both benefit uh, and uh, also be penalised by uh, how robust their ESG strategies are. In the future, we're very likely to have uh, green hedging available, which can translate into carbon credits and help with sustainability strategies. And that's something that we will be keeping our customer base updated on. Uh, global payments, uh, if factors like sanctions and regulations change, as we've seen uh, in Russia over the course of this year, uh, how will that uh, impact your international payments? So we've had several customers that have had trouble getting payments out of that region and have uh, had to diversify. Uh, you can always speak to us about our global, global payment solutions, compliance controls and fraud prevention measures. Uh, and lastly, uh, in terms of uh, particular 
industries and countries. If you're exposed to a country that remains highly exposed to global market trends or issues, how do you diversify away from that? So one very recent example has been China uh, over the past three or four years. Back in the Trump era, uh, we had the, uh, the trade war that impacted the currency very quickly. And we saw companies have to diversify away their supply chains. And then more recently uh, with the lockdowns in China, we've had companies uh, again, had to think about their diversification due to issues getting uh, payments in and out of China and also supplies. So as mentioned earlier, we do support more than 140 currencies across 200 countries, uh, and we're well experienced to be able to have a detailed conversation on this matter. So that concludes what I wanted to share today. Thank you very much uh, for, uh, for listening, and uh, I'll now hand back to Tech Lee. Thank you, Edward. Thank you very much. Now we move on to the next speaker, Ms. Kala. Ms. Kala is the Commercial Counselor at the Philippine Trade and Investment Centre, Singapore. The Commercial sec Section of the Embassy of the Republic of Philippines in Singapore. Kala is a commercial. Kala has a wide, so-called, of a bus experience. Um, she before coming to to this post, she was the she was a commercial lawyer with experience in fields of power, utilities, energy, and a focus on renewable energy, regulatory and legis legislative advocacy. Over to you, Kala. Thank you very much, Tech Lee, for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, I'm Carla Greppo, Commercial Counselor of the Philippine Trade and Investment Center in Singapore. My office is the first touch point in Singapore for assistance in doing business in the Philippines. And today, I will be presenting the various fiscal and non-fiscal incentives contained in a recent tax reform, as well as a quick rundown of game-changing policy reforms designed to make the Philippines more investor friendly. Next slide, please. Okay, so under the under President Ferdinand Marcos Jr.'s eight-point economic agenda, the Marcos administration vowed to create more jobs by promoting investments, improving infrastructure, and ensuring energy security. The agenda also includes increasing employability, encouraging R&D and innovation, and enhancing the digital economy as well as creating green jobs by pursuing a green and blue economy. In fact, just last uh, September 8th, during President Marcus Jr.'s state visit here in Singapore, the current administration received 6.54 billion US dollars in investment pledges during his Singapore trip. And the investment commitments are expected to generate jobs for 15,000 people and include a 5 billion US dollar investment in electric tricycles and 1.2 billion US dollars in floating solar technology. Next slide, please. Okay, so now for my main assignment. The signing by our former President Duterte in early 2021 of the Corporate Recovery and Tax Incentives for Enterprises, more popularly known as CREATE Act, rationalizes, modernizes, and offers more relevant incentives to investors. So under the CREATE Act, an immediate reduction of corporate income tax rates for domestic foreign and non-resident foreign corporations will take effect from 30% to 25%. And this will be retroactively applied back to July 2020 and will be in effect until this year, 2022. Then the corporate income tax shall continue to steadily decrease further by 1% every year thereafter until the rate reaches 20% in 2027. So other than that, the uh, income tax reduction, the CREATE Act also provides for a generous incentive package where businesses can enjoy four to seven years of income tax holiday and up to 10 years of 5% SCIT or special corporate income tax rate or enhanced deductions. So prior to this tax reform, the Philippines in fact had the highest or one of the highest corporate income taxes in the ASEAN region. So with these reforms, we are now on a more or less equal footing with other neighboring ASEAN countries. Next slide, please. 
Okay, and then under the same law, create, the president may also exercise flexibility in granting incentives for highly desirable projects with a minimum investment capital of 50 billion pesos or at least uh, 10,000 jobs generation jobs generated or direct local employment generation um, also included in this customizable customizable incentive package um, financial support could include um, use of government resources such as land use water appropriation power provision and some for other forms of budgetary support under our budget laws next slide please Okay, so the CREATE Act also goes hand in hand with what we call the Strategic Investment Priority Plan or SIPP. So the SIPP under CREATE identifies industries and projects that will be eligible for fiscal incentives. And the goal is for us to attract high value, modern, strategic, and high technology projects that will strengthen our participation in the global value chain. So with the CREATE Act and SIPP, it established um, what we call industry tiers, which will determine the period within which the tax incentives will apply. So I will discuss those periods in later slides. So basically under this model, for a project to qualify for registration and incentives, the activity should be listed in the SIPP, which was formulated with, of course, the input of our Board of Investments along with other applicable agencies. And in a nutshell, the higher the industry tier, the longer period for the availment of the tax incentives. Next slide, please. Okay, so again, under this incentive scheme, there are now three tiers which are outlined in our SIPP and CREATE. So these are the three tiers that are applicable for fiscal incentives. So for example, for tier one, okay, the there will be four years income tax holiday and 10 years enhanced deductions or 5% or SEIT, special corporate income tax. So uh, the investor gets to choose between the 10-year ED or 5% SEIT at the option of the investor, which will be exercised at the time of registration. So again, the length of incentives or the length of the period during which the incentives will apply will depend on the tier classification, which is in turn based on the levels of technology as well as their location. So there is a premium for those located farther away from the metros or the urban centers. So for tier one, so some examples include qualified manufacturing, including agro-processing, like manufacturing of cement. Uh, it also includes agriculture, fishery, forestry. Um, and then this is also where infrastructure and logistics fall, including pu public-private partnerships with LGUs, including air transport and water transport, as well as export ser services, including ITBPM and transcription centers. Next slide. Okay, so for tier two, so tier two, it uh, it enjoys a higher, uh, longer period than uh, tier one. So it's for tier two, it's five years income tax holiday, and then the same ten year enhanced deductions or five percent SEIT at the option of the investor. And again, this will be exercised at the. Uh, this option will be exercised during registration. So some examples include industrial. Uh, Industrial value chain gaps like iron and steel production, copper and nickel production, and green ecosystems like uh, EVs, electric vehicle assembly, manufacture of EV parts, components, and systems. So these are just some examples of companies that you see on the screen of those that fall within these tiers. Um, so we have, yeah, Panwa Group, China Bound Steel Group, um, Tesla, Innovate Motors, etc. Next slide. Also under tier two are health-related activities like manufacture of vaccines, um, and also defense-related activities like manufacture of hand handguns and shipbuilding vessels for our Philippine Navy. And finally, food security-related activities like integrated dairy production and processing. Next slide. 
Okay, so for Tier 3, which enjoys uh, the longest period for income tax holiday availment, which is six years, Okay, so uh, some examples include activities that adopt advanced digital production technologies of the 4IR. So some examples given were the establishment and operation of data centers. So in this space, there are in fact significant investments from Singapore countries. Um, some of them were signed during the last visit here in Singapore of our president, President Marcus Jr. And then other examples also include highly technical manufacturing and the production of innovative products. So for example, um, integrated R&D, we have Dyson, um, establishment of an R&D center. So have, we have one major Taiwanese company coming in as well. Um, and uh, another example is uh, camera components, components manufacturing with integrated R&D that's coming in from a German company. Next slide. Also, we're happy to share that with the passage of the Foreign Investments Act amendments, the Philippines can be a second home for international startup firms involved in advanced technology with a capital requirement of only 100,000 US dollars and only 15 employees from the local workforce. Next slide. Similarly, we have amended our Retail Trade Liberalization Act. So this lowers the capital requirement for foreign investors involved in retail from a previous investment requirement of 2.5 million US dollars down to just 500,000 US dollars or around 25 million pesos. Next slide. And then we also have the recently signed amendments of the Public Service Act. It likewise eased foreign equity restrictions in key sectors from the previous maximum 40% to 100% foreign equity. So this is a major reform as these sectors, which have been protected for over 85 years. So these include uh, what you see on the screen, telecommunications, shipping, air carriers, railways, subways, airports, and toll roads. They are now open for 100% foreign equity. And then for other sectors, um, it's still reserved for 60% Filipino ownership and for 40% foreign equity, like distribution of electricity, transmission of electricity, etc. Next slide. Another positive development, um, just before President Duterte ended his term, he issued Executive Order 127 and this liberalized access to satellite services. So this is important because it allows greater interconnectivity and access to broadband. So the goal was that uh, so for the far-flung areas to no longer be limited by broadband access provided by the telcos. So with liberalized satellite services to improve broadband and interconnectivity, we would see accelerated and unprecedented broadband growth in the economy. So in fact, one example is that Philippines is set to be the first country in Southeast Asia to avail of space access low Earth orbits orbit satellite network constellation called Starlink. So that, 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 that's being finalized. Next slide. Okay, next slide. Okay, and then additionally, the Philippines, of course, is strategically located. We have preferential access in major markets through our free trade agreements, which, of course, not only improves trade between nations, but promotes investments between the nations. So some examples, we continue to benefit from EU's generalized scheme of preferences plus or EU GSP plus. So likewise, we are currently working to push for more products to be included in the talks for the U.S. Generalized System of Preferences, or GSP. So these add to the value of making the Philippines a manufacturing location for GSP products because that means products manufactured in the Philippines can enter the EU and USP markets duty-free or with preferential rates. And of course, like Singapore, the Philippines is also part of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, or RCEP. So these cover around 28% of the global market and 30% of the world's economy and trade. 
So, and even during the pandemic, the Philippines continued to be proactive in enhancing strategic bilateral and regional relations with other trade partners. Next slide. Okay, and of course, the Philippines will continue to sustain the infrastructure momentum started in the previous administration's Build, Build, Build program to be expanded even further by the current administration's Build Better More program. So among the major transportation and infrastructure projects that will be implemented include the North-South Commuter Railway, the Metro Manila Subway Project, and Light Rail Transit Line 1 Cavite Extension Project. So these are just some examples of how we are building more railways, mass urban transport, airports, seaports, more bridges and roads for better access. Next slide, please. Of course, Singapore will always be a vital part of the Philippines' growth story. Under the Make It Happen campaign in the Philippines, Make It Happen in the Philippines campaign, the identified priority sectors of electronics, automotive, aerospace, copper, information technology, and business process management present many opportunities for Singaporean investors. Singaporean investors may also now venture into fintech, smart technology, digitalization, e-commerce, urban solutions, and green technology. Next slide. Yeah, so ladies and gentlemen, many opportunities await you in my country. So I hope you would explore these opportunities with our help and of course SBF. And again, I thank you for the opportunity to speak before you this afternoon. My team looks forward to engaging with you. Feel free to reach out to my office in the contact information flashed on your screen. Again, thank you very much for your time and have a good rest of the webinar. Back thank to you, you. Techly. Thank you, Carla. Now we bring the next speaker from Mindanao. Um, Mindanao's new economy and new opportunity by Mr. Romeo Monte Negro, Assistant Secretary, Deputy Executive Director, Mindanao Development Authorities. Romeo basically is currently serving as the Deputy Executive Director of the Mindanao Development Authority, the principal government agency mandated to coordinate the integrated development of Mindanao. Over to you, Mindanao. Uh, uh, Romeo, sorry. Thank you, Tech Lee, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to, the, to tell the story of Mindanao. I mean, quite uh, a number of things that happened uh, over the last couple of months since we um, embarked on a business, Mindanao business mission to Singapore and the eventual signing of agreements and firming up of partnerships uh, between Mindanao and uh, Singaporean counterparts. And uh, we hope to be able to continue and, and uh, to push for such momentum. And uh, this opportunity this afternoon uh, definitely will help us uh, along that line. And uh, may we therefore um, provide you with this um, updates on developments and uh, what, uh, what is shaping up I mean, now in terms of a viable destination for uh, investments. And uh, for context, uh, may I just also um, highlight that um, as had been uh, stressed in the, the earlier presentations, but uh, particularly by attorney Carla, in terms of uh, the overall and in the broader investment opportunities and uh, the corresponding incentives that are now being made uh, to favor entry of investments uh, to the country. There is so much uh, also that uh, are much put into context and are now being able uh, to present itself um, as a destination for investments. But uh, for context, again, uh, let me just uh, highlight some of these very important points. Um, Mindanao is the second largest island uh, of the Philippines. In fact, uh, the, the, that part of the country which is very much closest to any ASEAN country, um, particularly our province in Tawi-Tawi is a few hours away to Malaysia and therefore represents a, a much bigger opportunity for um, realizing uh, on a uh, bottom-stop approach in terms of ASEAN integration. Why many of the protocols that are now being laid down uh, in ASEAN uh, actually first started in, in many discussions with the cross-border cooperation of um, Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, East ASEAN growth area, for which Mindanao um, is very much part of as a focal country or a focal um, area. 
we are we consider ourselves as as your neighbor um actually uh, with with the direct flight uh, available uh, from uh, Singapore to Davao or Davao to Singapore uh, taking only about um 3 hours and 55 minutes of, of that ride and therefore providing the ease of um movement uh, between the Singapore and, and Davao and uh, many other parts of um, Mindanao in terms of investment opportunities. Mindanao um, accounts for um, a sizable chunk of size of, of the Philippines uh, population. Uh, we are about 26 million uh, in, in Mindanao um, across six regions and uh, several hundred um, municipalities and over 10,000 um, barangays spread across islands, spread across uh, mainland Mindanao. But from the standpoint of um, uh, business or economics, um, we are a considerable consuming market. Um, our population in Mindanao is as big as the entire continent of Australia. We're twice bigger than Paul, Portugal and Hungary. Uh, half the population of South Korea and, well, we're five times uh, the population of Singapore. And therefore, um, we present a, a very um, interesting opportunity in terms of uh, that market size. Our GDP is, is very much um, uh, dominated by the services sector, which is, of course, um, uh, reflective of the overall um, Philippine picture in terms of our GDP makeup, um, being a um, consumption-driven um, economy uh, with services accounting for half of our um, GDP. The Mindanao GDP in terms of size, while it uh, accounts for um, around 17% of the country's total GDP, but we are um, perhaps equal to the um, GDP of uh, economy of Slovenia, we're a little lower than Lithuania and um, twice bigger than Cyprus and then Iceland. So there is um, quite a bit of, of um, um, significance of Mindanao uh, looking at it in terms of its economic make and its economic strength, um, apart from just being um, part of the Philippines. Now let's look at how Mindanao performed uh, prior to COVID. Um, in the last 15 years prior to COVID, actually Mindanao had demonstrated a, an economic performance that is much faster than the national average. In fact, in 2018, we posted a 7.1 GRDP, um, a bit higher than 6.7% uh, national average. And our investment inflow to Mindanao jumped 10 times um, from an average of 120, 125 million US dollars between 2001 and 2010 to around $1.2 billion on the average between 2011 and 2019. And uh, our investments, in fact, uh, had, had uh, been dominated uh, by um, um, investments in um, agribusiness um, expansion, uh, manufacturing, and uh, as well as energy. And in 2019, we, in fact, uh, prior to pandemic, posted the highest um, uh, investment uh, uh, as, as recorded by the Board of Investments uh, with around um, 100 billion uh, pesos in Mindanao, um, demonstrating and invalidating the fact that indeed uh, we are ripe uh, for, for investments, both domestic and international. Um, very distinct, very far from the kind of Mindanao that probably you might be hearing or might be seeing um, 20, 15, 10 years ago uh, in terms of perception and the way we are reported um, out there in, in the international media because of the many things, including the improvement of the peace process and the peace and order situation that we now enjoy in Mindanao that contributed to uh, improvement in, uh, in the economic situation, especially in the Bangsamoro region. Um, Mindanao also is now becoming a focus of attention for many of our um, players in the BPO sector. Um, with Dabao, for instance, in the course of the pandemic, uh, the city of Dabao had uh, accommodated an increase of 1,000 seats uh, for um, all centers um, just um, late last year, and therefore validating the fact that indeed um, uh, many um, Manila based companies are looking at um, setting up footprints uh, in Mindanao, particularly here in Davao. The global demand for, for agri products also is very much um, delivering for Mindanao. Uh, it's it's um, strong performance uh, given the um, agriculture contribution of Mindanao to overall national um, economic growth. And in fact, even during pandemic, uh, which uh, definitely had uh, changed the way we lived, um, put us into a halt and uh, disrupted uh, our way of lives, but nonetheless demonstrated resiliency for Mindanao uh, because of its strong agriculture performance. So while the rest of, of the world uh, were in lockdown, um, but they still need to eat three times a day, 
And therefore, Mindanao commodities that are traditionally being exported to various um, destinations um, had uh, continued to deliver such performance um, against the backdrop of pandemic. So in terms of uh, the economic growth, um, while um, Philippines suffered uh, a, a significant um, drawdown of, of its economic performance, which is not in isolation uh, to, to the rest of the world because most of the economists, most economists have also demonstrated such um, um, upset. But nonetheless, uh, consistent with its showing, Mindanao uh, performed quite relatively better than the national average. In fact, um, our strong showing in the agri sector on the green line validated indeed that while all else, particularly in the industries and the manufacturing sectors took a dive in terms of growth, our agriculture sector uh, posted a positive growth uh, against the backdrop of pandemic, thereby delivering for us um, a ray of hope and a spark of light in this in that otherwise dark economic reality that we all went through uh, in the last two years or in the last four months of the pandemic lockdown. And therefore, moving towards economic recovery, there is so much that we are um, pinning our hopes on and um, anchoring many of our strategies uh, essentially on uh, the agriculture sector. And this is where we have uh, positioned in the now in terms of um, priorities of the national government in terms of budget. Uh, to ensure that Mindanao continue to perform its role uh, in terms of um, agricultural strength. And uh, investing in Mindanao's um, agriculture is making sense for us because um, we've been considered that as the country's food basket. With over 43% of the country's food trade, one-third of the country's farm area um, located in Mindanao. And therefore, again, this was against the backdrop of pandemic, uh, global disruption, yet we posted uh, a performance of being top two in the world in terms of the export of cab and dish bananas. Some of it actually end up in Hong Kong markets. We are top three in seaweeds, uh, fourth in pineapple exports, seventh in rubber, and eighth in tuna. These products do not uh, um, involve Luzon and Visayas, but are predominantly or almost 100% produced in Mindanao. And so through the years, uh, Mindanao has been able to demonstrate resiliency in terms of being able to um, uh, penetrate and activate market destinations uh, for many of our agricultural uh, products. And if there are problems in certain market de destinations, um, it is able to activate other alternate market destinations. That's why um, there has been a continuing um, um, export of, of our commodities, even against external shocks. And so if you're looking at the kind of performance that um, Philippines had been able to post um, uh, of in the last recent weeks, uh, especially in this third quarter of 2022, and where Philippines is um, forecasted to be um, leading the pack in ASEAN in terms of uh, economic growth, um, it has been validated by um, third quarter um, GRDP performance of the Philippines at 7.6%, uh, um, making Philippines the fastest growing economy in the Indo Pacific. Uh, surpassed only by India and Vietnam. And uh, we are looking at uh, the scenario where Mindanao will continue to still outperform the national average um, as, as um, um, validated by, by last year's um, showing of 6.1% um, versus um, um, national average uh, of, of lower than uh, that at 5.7%. Uh, With uh, Mindanao regions, uh, the ones in the bottom um, um, list, uh, outperforming many other regions of, of the country, Indeed, um, indicating that Mindanao was solidly um, being able to demonstrate resiliency against uh, the realities of the pandemic. Therefore, moving forward, as we present investment opportunities are now um, being um, framed, uh, being put together um, in, in Mindanao, we are um, stressing and underpinning uh, the important link of um, the growth corridors that uh, are, are emerging in Mindanao with the necessary links to transport connectivity and the uh, expansion of the agriculture and as well as um, sustainable energy. These are all framed uh, under what we call Mindanao Development Corridors where uh, we put it we make sense in every airport to attract investment to specific area, to specific location in Mindanao and where uh, we position uh, the needed uh, enabling framework and enabling environment and, and policy support as well as infrastructure support of the government to that particular investment direction. 
and so that if you are attracting investors that would want to uh, put uh, money towards um, aquaculture and, and, and fisheries culture in, in, in the fisheries investments in Mindanao, uh, particularly in the western Mindanao area, for instance, that's where we are also directing the needed support of the government to make sure that those investments are, 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 are becoming viable. This is the same um, sense uh, we are putting together in terms of making sure that investments in Mindanao, um, particularly in the areas of manufacturing and agribusiness, are facilitated, linked, supported by the kind of infrastructure support uh, so that logistics are becoming more competitive, uh, making sure that production areas are linked um, to the highways, to the processing centers, and towards the export gateways, whether ports and airports. And that's why in Mindanao, we continue to keep tab of um, what were previously built as uh, build, build, build projects, are now termed as build, build, build more, representing a menu of um, catalytic and transfor transformational priority infrastructure projects in Mindanao, which we hope um, are the same uh, priorities uh, that are now uh, being given attention and funding by the national government or by take-in by um, international partners, financial institutions, and the ODAs uh, to um, kick off um, implementation of these very important projects in Mindanao, particularly um, in terms of improving our transport connectivity. The challenge in the Philippines uh, has always been in terms of the farm size for many of our agricultural commodities uh, on account of many laws uh, that uh, need to be um, reckoned with. That's why in Mindanao, uh, we are endeavoring to put together agri-economic zones. And this was supported by a study which we put together together with um, the uh, Food um, Agriculture Organization of UN uh, to be able to identify areas in Mindanao uh, that are viable for specific commodities and so that uh, this can have uh, the volume that is needed and that will warrant the establishment of the processing and the value adding systems. Uh, in the same way as we continue to present um, existing economic zones in Mindanao that uh, continue to attract locators, both uh, foreign and domestic, for value adding and processing of certain commodities that are distinct domestically and as well as internationally, um, considering that um, Few ports in Mindanao are also uh, the launching uh, pad for international um, destinations. In terms of planning and, and presenting our framework for development, uh, we don't just look um, inwardly uh, domestically, but we look down south, uh, particularly in our relationship with um, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei Darussalam in a sub regional cooperation or what is called Mini ASEAN for us, BAMP IAGA. This is a four-country cooperation that do not involve the entire countries, but only designated focus areas. And in the case of the Philippines, Mindanao and the province of Palawan are the ones um, um, taking advantage of the sub-regional economic cooperation and therefore um, allowing for us here in Mindanao to penetrate immediately an 80 million market uh, for the focus areas of uh, the three other countries uh, and the entire country of Mindanao. Uh, this is a mechanism that allowed for us to establish direct shipping route and direct flights to our neighbors, rather than the usual route of going to um, Jakarta, if you wanted to go to North Sulawesi and Manado, or flying all the way to um, Kuala Lumpur, if you wanted to fly to just a neighbor, Kota Kinabalukun, and the many other areas of the Kone. This is also very much strategic for us in Mindanao, given that in the next couple of years, uh, with a timeline of between five to ten years, Jakarta is going to have its new capital um, transferred, um, or Indonesia will have to have its new capital transferred from Jakarta to a new city in East Kalimantan called Nusantara. And this is just a few hours away from it now. All our efforts in their BAMP IAGA are also very much supported by our development partners in terms of um, capacity building and uh, financing for many of um, the big ticket projects within the sub-region um, through our cooperation arrangements with the Northern Territory of Australia, China, Japan, Korea, and of course, our regional cooperation advisor, the Asian Development Bank. Now, our focus um, in Mindanao uh, will continue to be um, uh, devoted towards ensuring that we are able to establish um, regional interlinkages and logistic hubs. And uh, we draw lessons from the disruptions brought about by the pandemic, therefore, 
the more that we are able to establish hubs, uh, especially for our products and commodities, the more that we will be able to position better um, our um, commodities, both for domestic and international destinations. Um, accelerating connect connectivity in terms of transport and in terms of internet access, which is why there is so much that Mindanao is um, aspiring for. Uh, once uh, the uh, vision and, and, and the target for um, the Philippines being able to tap into um, SpaceX and Starlink in terms of the low orbit satellite and the multi orbit satellite enabled internet access, we made available, especially in the what we call geographically um, isolated and disadvantaged areas in Mindanao. Areas that ironically are um, the ones that predominantly produce many of our agricultural products. We're also making sure that there is a link for um, this connectivity to furthering uh, the growth of our industries in the agri-manufacturing. And for making sure that our economic activities in Mindanao and in the production side uh, are also being powered by sustainable energy. And this is where we are now very much proactive and deliberate in making sure that every effort we put together in terms of energy investment is directly related to value adding our agri-fisheries sector. We are glad that this has been highlighted uh, in the State of the Nation address of the president, where the use of renewable energy is on top uh, of the countries, of, of the presidents of this administration's climate agenda. And Mindanao stands the chance to be able to benefit so much from this agenda considering that uh, there's quite a lot of initiatives being worked out right now in Mindanao um, to make sure that um, small renewable energy projects are immediately uh, delivering benefits to agriculture activities, and including uh, in the transport activities and logistics activities in Mindanao. A, another business case that we are set to complete soon with a, a targeted switch off early next year of a one megawatt um, and 650 kilowatt solar power hybridized battery um, in a very remote um, area of the Philippines, uh, part of Mindanao, but much closest to Malaysia. Um, that's the towns of Cebuto and Setangkay in the province of Tawi-Tawi, um, where um, along with several other municipalities account for one-fourth of uh, the Philippine um, seaweed production. Unfortunately, um, these areas, while um, predominantly producing seaweeds, only produce road-ride seaweeds because there's no electricity and no water. That's why we have made them as a priority and pilot for um, solar powered hybridized with battery and soon um, an addition of um, water desalination projects to complete the entire value chain of the seaweeds being processed from where it is being produced and making our seaweeds farmers, not just mere farmers, but exporters of Karajinan up to Korea, to Japan and many other market destinations. Now, Overall, what makes renewable energy in Mindanao viable? Well, we need about 3,000 megawatts of additional capacity in Mindanao between now and 2030. We need an additional 10,000 megawatts in Mindanao uh, between now and 2040 uh, at the rate of um, 5 to 7% annual uh, growth rate of um, energy demand in Mindanao. We translate that to about 50 to 100 megawatts every year needed in Mindanao. So our effort is to move towards attracting more of the renewable energy injected into the Mindanao grid rather than relying more of the fossil, which is already affecting us because Mindanao today is being run 70% by fossil, mostly coal, which is subject to market volatility, foreign exchange fluctuation, and therefore making us less competitive in terms of our electricity rates. And we wanted um, to reverse uh, that particular scenario and energy mix by um, achieving a 70-30 mix by 2040. Another very important um, um, realizations of many of our proponents for, for RE are now um, embracing and enjoying is that we now have a supportive policy regime uh, in so far as renewable energy. One, um, this was just about uh, two days ago. That's why it was not part in the earlier slides um, um, presented by attorney Carla in terms of industries and sectors where um, foreign ownership is now um, allowed up to 100%. Uh, just about two days ago, um, the Department of Justice had issued a, an opinion um, sought by the Department of Energy um, indicating that indeed renewable energy, except for hydropower projects, so this cover solar, uh, geothermal, um, 
wind uh, and, 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 the, and the likes um, now allowed for 100% ownership um, in, in the Philippines. So this is something that is very much viable in Mindanao because it is in Mindanao where we have so much of these um, potential um, energy sources uh, that need to be pursued and, and developed. Another um, sets of policies uh, that are making it viable for RE include renewable portfolio standards where every electric cooperative and distribution utilities in the country are um, mandated to allocate um, their demand uh, and, and, and supply requirement coming from renewable energy at a cascading uh, rate of 1% to 20%. And uh, another um, uh, policy being uh, enjoyed right now by many players in the RE is the Green Energy Auction Program, where um, demand for renewable energy at the market uh, especially with the wholesale electricity spot market are being aggregated and so that these are uh, being auctioned as one. And then you have the green energy option program where every manufacturing company uh, that would want to move towards net zero agenda would contract directly to any renewable energy player or um, 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 merchant um, RE player rather than um, buying electricity from a distribution utility. Or assuring itself of a 100% RE supply um, um, into its uh, facilities and, and, and manufacturing plants. And then uh, for um, the household level and, and, and small commercial level um, uh, scales, there is also what we call um, enhanced net metering. So that those who have rooftop um, solar panels, even at the household level, but around 100 kilowatt, um, can enjoy uh, the net metering um, um, uh, initiative. And uh, uh, this is about um, being able to sell uh, to the utility any excess uh, that you have uh, generated out of um, the solar panels above your rooftop. And this is also what's being designed right now for many subdivisions or, or villages uh, that are being uh, developed uh, to already integrate in the design um, solar uh, rooftops uh, in the, on the roofs of, of those um, houses. Now, uh, there are um, also ongoing policy and research development activities to support still the viability of RE deployment uh, in Mindanao. Um, one is the preferential dispatch for uh, renewable energy, where um, RE capacities are, are going to be dispatched first versus um, fossil technology. And so that uh, merchant players that do not have contracts or bilateral contracts with distribution utility or have no contract with any off-taker can be assured of getting utilized because of that mass dispatch protocol for RE over fossil in a market and system setup. There's also the establishment of competitive renewable energy zones so that um, areas that are being developed as economic zones can be supplied uh, directly by a renewable energy um, capacities. And therefore making um, the output, the products of, of those economic zones um, labeled 100% uh, um, processed using renewable energy. A waste to energy development is also now being started in, in some parts of um, of now. And another study is, is being um, worked out uh, in identifying areas in Mindanao that's viable for wind um, technology. Another um, very important uh, in emerging technology uh, now being um, worked out for viability uh, in fact, pilot cases and, and business cases are now being started in Mindanao, um, particularly on marine energy and tidal stream energy. And uh, one of this is being supported by a Singapore-based uh, startup company and uh, in partnership with an Australian technology. Um, later on, uh, coming up with the viability of um, providing a um, investment scale, uh, renewable energy, um, um, tapping um, tidal uh, wave and, and ocean um, um, current uh, to produce renewable energy in specific locations in Mindanao. And then they expanded a uh, rooftop solar program to attract more of our um, establishments, malls, um, man, uh, manufacturing companies, and, and warehouses, and including um, subdivisions to put up a uh, rooftop uh, on, on their uh, solar rooftop uh, systems uh, to be able to rely less from uh, utilities and generate their own sources of electricity. And, and all of these um, efforts um, are also being made favorable by the availability of international finance, um, the Green Climate Fund, the Climate Adaptation Fund. And, uh, all of these are, are being facilitated by several um, agencies of the government, uh, 
Linda is one of them, and supported by our Department of Finance, uh, the top into those international finance um, institutions for energy transition initiatives um, in Mindanao. And again, as I have said earlier, this was one um, um, project that was firmed up uh, during the visit of the president in September um, in Singapore, which, uh, which hopes to be able to work out somewhere between 10 million to 100 million US dollars of um, projects that we termed under blue economy or marine renewable energy uh, to include um, water production, desalination, electric boats, aquaculture, aside from. So overall, um, this is a, a momentum that we hope to be able to sustain and where we direct so much of our attention in Mindanao to improve infrastructure and the connectivity that is needed to lower the cost of logistics and transportation from uh, farm areas to the processing centers to the export gateways and making sure that our coordination process with several agencies of the government are enforced uh, in terms of streamlining those, those procedures and making transaction more um, efficient. And um, adopting uh, the principle of uh, inclusive business and so that in every investment, particularly in the rural areas, these are designed uh, to include um, rural communities as part of the business and so that uh, there is viability for them uh, being scaled up rather than just continue to be a subsistence level of, of farming. And uh, presenting uh, a Mindanao collective trademark where Mindanao products um, are able to achieve voluntary standards of good agricultural practices, certified organic, single origin, uh, rainforest alliance, and later on, uh, a label that indicates it is produced, processed using 100% renewable energy so that we can penetrate bigger markets such as the EU. And also for Mindanao um, economy to be integrated and, and for the sectors to be integrated with innovations in the ecosystem, linking our agriculture with the food, uh, water, energy nexus and the infrastructure and logistics, as well as ensuring that um, enough efforts are also put together to make our infrastructure in Mindanao climate proof and to make our agriculture um, systems um, able to uh, deal and mitigate uh, the challenges of climate change. And all of this will have to be worked out under such innovation ecosystem um, set up that we hope uh, um, to be uh, accomplished and um, uh, developed in Mindanao. And uh, in everything that is being worked out uh, by the private sector with specific agencies of the government, in Mindanao, um, our office provides the facilitating role uh, to handhold uh, every proponent going through the regulatory processes of uh, the several layers and agencies of the government to make sure that in Mindanao, um, doing business is much faster and better. And so um, everything else is now um, available in Mindanao and where opportunities for, for Singapore investments I may want to take a look at. Financial centers may want to explore the viability of downloading capital for um, infrastructure, for renewable energy, for agriculture expansion, property development, and many other potential areas of um, investments in Mindanao. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Romeo. Thank you so much for the insightful information. Let me just introduce the next speaker, uh, Ms. Laurie Beth, professional lawyer on the topic of legality of doing business in Philippines. Laurie Beth is a Philippine qualified CPA lawyer in the commercial practice who, practice, who specializes in cross-border tax and trade and data privacy. Over to you, Laurie. Thank you for the kind introduction, Techly, and thanks for the invitation to participate in today's webinar. So good afternoon, everyone, and to the esteemed roster of speakers in this afternoon's webinar as led by the Honorable Dr. Fernandez. This afternoon, next slide, please. Next slide. Yes. This afternoon, I will be sharing on various legal related matters relevant for foreign direct investors who would like to enter the Philippine market. And these range from government agencies that businesses need to work with to modes of entry, modes of engagement, paid up capital requirements, business registration processes, and key challenges in doing business in the Philippines. And this in turn segues into highlights of Philippine employment and tax regimes. 
in the interest of time, these are but high-level discussions. And should you have any further questions after this webinar, you may reach out to Singapore Business Federation and they can in turn course the questions to me. So next slide, please. So in 2021, Singapore was one of the top source of inbound foreign direct investments or FDIs into the Philippines, which is a market of um, 110 million people. Uh, it has an English speaking and adaptable workforce uh, and 7.4% GDP growth. And as mentioned earlier by Dr. Fernandez, Philippine startups also tend to have more attractive valuations. And notably, in key industries, uh, there are not so many, in fact, there is a dearth of state-owned enterprises, and this makes up for an, an even more playing or competitive field for foreign uh, investors. Now, uh, due to various economic, social, political, and regulatory developments, there is a unique window of opportunity that is present for foreign direct investors who would like to invest in the Philippines. Among these, I would like to highlight the combo of the latest 2022 Strategic Investment Priorities Plan and the Corporate Recovery and Tax Incentives for Enterprises or CREATE law, which has rationalized a menu of tax and fiscal incentives. Again, in the interest of time, I will no longer be expounding on these as they were also extensively discussed earlier by Attorney Carla Grepo. I will go and move on to other legal developments in the form of amendments to the Retail Trade Liberalization Act. Under these amendments, subject to certain reciprocity requirements, foreign retailers are now allowed to enter the Philippine retail market through physical or online stores with less amount of capitalization. So that would be a minimum on paid up capital requirement of 500,000 or 200,000 US dollars, those are denominated in US dollars per store for foreign retailers with multiple branches. The previous minimum capitalization used to be $2.5 million. There's also the amendment to the Public Services Act, which now allows 100% foreign equity in telecommunications, shipping, air carriers, railways, subways, airports, and tall roads, subject to certain reciprocity requirements as well. Also, entities controlled by or acting on behalf of foreign governments or foreign state-owned enterprises are now prohibited from owning capital in a public utility or critical infrastructure. But for as long as the foreign investor is not a foreign government or foreign state-owned enterprise, 100% uh, foreign equity in the said um, industries are still allowed. Aside from these, um, the new Philippine administration is also more business friendly, especially to foreign investors and technocrats are being appointed to lead key government agencies. Speaking of key government agencies, next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. Typically, foreign direct investors would have to work with the agencies that are in this slide. There's the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is where corp corporate entities are registered. The Bureau of Internal Revenue, or the equivalent of IRS, it is the agency mandated to collect national taxes. The Banco Central ng Pilipinas, or Central Bank, which is the equivalent of MAS, it regulates banks and financial institutions. It is also the agency wherein foreign capital can be registered. Although the registration of foreign capital is not mandatory, then again, it is beneficial for capital re repatriation purposes. The Department of Trade and Industry and the Board of Investments are likewise key agencies for purposes of availment of trade and fiscal incentive and incentives. Meanwhile, um, should uh, a business wish to import uh, certain articles, one needs to apply for an import entry with the Bureau of Customs. As an employer, any business is also required to res register with so the social security system, PhilHealth and Pag-ibig, for the purpose of providing social security benefits to employees. With respect to personal data protection, the National Privacy Commission regulates uh, both public and private entities alike. And of course, in addition to all of these, businesses also need to work with 
relevant local government units in the city or municipality with jurisdiction over the registered place of business. Next slide, please. Now, there are various modes of entry into the Philippine market, taking into consideration different levels of control and risk of a foreign investor. The least risky mode, but also allows an investor to have the least magnitude of control over his business in the Philippines is through exporting as an agent or a distributor. This way, an investor can test the Philippine market with the least amount of commitment. He can also license or franchise his brand, trademark, or know-how to a local licensee or franchisee through a contractual mode of entry into the Philippines known as licensing or franchising. And there is also a more direct foreign investment mode uh, whereby one can enter the Philippine market by way of a joint venture with a local partner. Or that particular foreign investor can also venture forth without a partner, uh, but using the other modes of engagement, which would include the setup of a wholly owned subsidiary or a branch. Next slide, slide please. Okay. As mentioned, a foreign company can set up a local subsidiary or a branch office. The difference between these two is that a subsidiary would be a separate juridical entity and thus would be legally independent of its foreign parent, whereas a branch would be the same juridical entity as its parent company and hence will be considered as a resident, resident foreign corporation. There are also special types of branches, such as regional operating headquarters, uh, regional area headquarters, or representative offices. But of these uh, types of special branch offices, only uh, a regional operating headquarter, or ROHQ, can be allowed to earn income but only for with respect to qualifying services to affiliates, branches, or subsidiaries. And also, um, this is uh, a relatively new feature of uh, the amended Corporation Code of the Philippines. Uh, a single individual, even a foreigner, can now form a one-person a one corporation or an OPC. Next slide, please. With respect to paid-up cap capital requirements, a foreign corporation can set up a local subsidiary. By local, I mean a corporation with less than 40% ownership with a capitalization of 5,000 pesos. Meanwhile, foreign corporations can set up a branch office for $200,000, US dollars at that, except if the branch is a regional or air or uh, area headquarters or representative office. A regional headquarters uh, would require 50,000 US dollars, while a representative office would require 30,000 US dollars. So just for perspective, um, the rough conversion of, of um, Singapore dollars to pesos is uh, one Singapore dollar is roughly equivalent to 37 pesos. Um, now, next slide, please. Now, setting up a company in the Philippines requires registration with the Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, as mentioned earlier, as well as the relevant local government unit, which has jurisdiction over the place of business or the address of the leased premises of the company which is being set up. Uh, registration with the SEC will require reservation of the company name through an online registration website, as well as the submission of articles of incorporation and bylaws, and some and a board resolution which authorizes the registration of the entity together with the valid IDs of the incorporators. So if any of these documents, the articles uh, of incorporation or the board resolution are to be signed abroad, consularization or apo apostille, uh, apostilization will be required. After the SEC registration, a post-registration process will soon follow which um, would consist of registration with uh, the local government unit uh, and also um, tax and employer registrations. Tax registration with the Bureau of Internal Revenue would contemplate obtaining a certificate of registration from the BIR, as well as the registration of books of accounts and authority to print receipts. 
or in case a cash register machine is to be used by the business, uh, that would be a cash register machine registration. Meanwhile, uh, employer registration, as mentioned earlier, contemplates registration with the various um, social uh, security ser uh, services uh, or, or entities, government agencies, such as the social security system, Fil Philippine health insurance system, and the home development mutual fund. Next slide, please. Registration in the Philippines of a business um, is required whenever a company is uh, going to do business in the Philippines. Now, without a valid SEC registration, a foreign company cannot sue or enforce a foreign judgment in the Philippines. However, it can be sued. So even if, if a foreign corporation um, does not register with, it, with the Philippine Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, but does business in the Philippines, it can still be sued. So what's critical, though, at this juncture is properly defining the phrase doing business in the Philippines. And this begs the question, when can a foreign corporation be deemed to be doing business in the Philippines? So hence, we define it. The term doing business contemplates soliciting orders, service contracts, opening offices, uh, whether these are liaison offices or branches, appointing representatives or distributors dom domiciled in the Philippines, or who in any calendar year stay in the Philippines for a period uh, with a total of 180 days or more. Uh, these would uh, also include um, participating in the management, supervision, or control of any domestic business firm, entity, or corporation in the Philippines. So if for as long as a foreign corporation or foreign business performs these acts, it will be deemed to be doing business in the Philippines. So the term doing business, though, should not be confused with the phrase transacting business. Transacting business in the Philippines is just defined as a corporation's performance of acts for which it was created or exercises some of um, the functions for which it was organized. Um, the term transacting a business in the Philippines would require the appointment of a resident agent who may either be an individual residing in the Philippines or a domestic corporation which lawfully transacts business in the Philippines. Next slide, please. So just as in any other market, there will always be challenges for any foreign investor wishing to enter into the local market. So in the Philippines, foreign investors' top challenges are typically threefold. First is uh, this feature in Philippine labor and employment laws, uh, which I understand is uh, quite different uh, from, from that of um, the landscape here in Singapore. So the Philippine labor and employment laws uh, tend to tilt uh, in favor of the employee. So which means that when in doubt, the scales of justice typically lean towards the employees. And I will expound of, on this in my next slide. Second, uh, foreigners cannot own real property. So by real property, I'm pertaining to land here, uh, which cannot be owned by foreigners in light of certain cons constitutional prohib prohibitions, which restrict real property ownership only to Filipino citizens. Only in exceptional cases can foreigners own land. And that is when, for example, there are former Filipino citizens or if they inherit land via interstate succession. And uh, interstate succession would be inheritance without a will uh, and when they are the sole heir to the property. So third um, challenge for foreign investors would be the Philippines complicated tax regime. So uh, because of this complicated tax regime in cases of share transfers, which would be relevant um, for businesses that are doing um, corporate uh, and legal entity restructuring, um, there can be a transfer of ownership of shares. And this transfer of ownership can be a little bit tedious. Uh, and I will be expounding on the Philippine tax regime in the succeeding in my succeeding slides as well. Next slide, please. So earlier I mentioned that Philippine labor laws and remedies tend to lean in favor of the employee. 
In addition, there are three points that I would like to emphasize concerning the Philippine employment landscape. First uh, would be the two types of contractual arrangements uh, to procure services of individuals. One would be by way of an employer-employee relationship, and another would be an independent contractor-customer relationship. So the distinction between these, these two uh, would be more relevant now, nowadays, given the prevalence of the gig economy. As regards employees, businesses are required to comply with Philippine labor laws. How, uh, on the other hand, concerning independent contractors, Philippine civil laws and contractual terms of the agreement between uh, the independent contractor and the client will govern. However, uh, just a caution, businesses should never hire employees under the guise of an independent contract um, when they are really employees uh, just, to circum just to circumvent uh, Philippine labor laws. Now, uh, to differentiate an employee from an independent contractor, Philippine labor jurisprudence uses a fourfold test. Uh, this test uh, would include the following questions. First question would be, does the employer have the power to select and hire an employee? So the power to hire. Uh, next would be, the, does the employer pay wages? Uh, third would be, does the employer have the power to dismiss or fire the employee? And fourth, and the most important test of all, is whether an, an employer has the power to control the employee's conduct. So by controlling an employee's conduct, uh, this means that the employer has the power to control both the, the means uh, and the manner, as well as the goal uh, to achieve, um, to be achieved by the employee. If the answer to all of those questions is yes, then it means that the individual is an employee, even if um, there is, um, based on documentation, um, the, the individual is an independent contractor. So um, Philippine courts or the National Labor Relations Commission would tend to construe that person as an employee. And uh, this would be especially relevant in cases where the person files a complaint, a labor complaint. Now, if the person is an employee, there are three most common types of regular employment under the Philippine Labor Code. So the first would be permanent employment. These contemplate employees uh, that are recruited to undertake duties that are typically necessary or desirable for the employer's usual business. Hence, they are considered as regular or permanent employees. Next uh, type of employee or employment contract would be the fixed term employment contract. And these contracts contemplate hiring of employees for a specific project or undertaking that has a set completion or termination date when the employment begins. And then the third type of employment um, is the temporary employment, which contemplates temporary workers or casual workers who just perform seasonal work. Um, for example, these would be laborers that are hired for a single season, such as, for example, um, um, harvesting season. Hence, uh, they are considered as temporary workers. So when these types of, of employment are in place, employers cannot just terminate an employee or force him to resign which would be a, force, a form of constructive dismissal. Um, that uh, type of termination or constructive dismissal would require a just or authorized cause. So just causes of termination would refer to serious misconduct, willful disobedience, insubordination, gross and habitual neglect of duties, fraud, or willful breach of trust, loss of confidence, commission of a crime or offense, and any analogous cause. On the other hand, authorized causes of termination will, would refer to uh, labor-saving devices, such as redundancy, retrenchment, downsizing, closure or cessation of operations, and disease. So for just causes, uh, there should be two written notices. This is the twin notice requirement under Philippine labor laws. The first 
notice should apprise the employee of the particular act or omission for which their dismissal is being sought, followed by a notice of termination. And uh, the second note, the, the second notice, which is the second, the notice of termination, should be preceded by a hearing. On the other hand, for authorized causes, a written notice to the employee and the Department of Labor and Employment should be given at least 30 days before the effectivity of the termination. And this notice should specify the authorized cause. So this means that in case of termination, employees have due process rights in the form of substantive and procedural due process. So otherwise, if these uh, due process rights are not observed, they can file a labor complaint for illegal dismissal, which can make an employer uh, liable for reinstatement and or, and or payment of back wages and damages. Next slide, please. So now we move on to um, matters under the Philippine tax regime. So foreign investors should note that there are national internal revenue taxes, and these are collected by the Bureau of Internal Revenue and local business taxes, which are collected by the relevant local government unit with jurisdiction over the place of business or the local government unit which has issued the business permit, local business permit to the entity. So local business taxes are imposed on, on a business's uh, income, typically uh, based on the percentage of gross sales. Uh, the rates tend to fluctuate um, vary or rather vary uh, according to the local government's business code. So each uh, local government unit would have a, a local business code, uh, which would also contain a list of uh, revenues uh, that are to be collected uh, with a corresponding uh, local business tax percentage. And now we move on to the national internal revenue taxes because these are a lot more. So uh, any business which is a going concern would typically be subject to income taxes, such as anywhere else in the world. So currently, this uh, in the Philippines, this would be 25% of net taxable income for large corporate entities and 20% for SMEs. So for, and for ROHQs, the applicable tax rate would be 10%. If the regular corporate income tax due, however, is lower than 1% of gross income, then that particular amount, which would be 1% of gross income, would have to be paid. And that amount is called the minimum corporate income tax. Um, however, there can also be special tax regimes for investments which qualify under uh, the different tiers of the Strategic Investment Priorities Plan. There's also that. Uh, so this is, um, in, in a way, it's 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 related to the GS. It, it's a form of sales tax. Um, so in the Philippines, there's no GST, but there's VAT. So for sales, um, output VAT is imposed, and that would be 12% of the sales uh, for VAT taxpayers. And um, for purchases of goods and services, um, there's also input VAT. So a business would be required to register as a VAT taxpayer if it has more than 3 million in gross revenues, except if it qualifies as a VAT exempt taxpayer, or if the transaction is considered as zero rated under the Philippine tax code or special laws. Then uh, the VAT that would be payable by the business to the Bureau of Internal Revenue would be the difference between the output VAT uh, less the input VAT. So there's also a tax imposed on the remittance of, of profits. Um, so for a subsidiary of a local, of a foreign parent, um, there is um, repatriation of dividends. Um, and that would be subject to final withholding tax at a rate of 25%. If the relevant uh, preferential tax rate is applied, uh, it can be lower. So, for example, the Philippine-Singapore Double Tax Avoidance Agreement uh, provides for a preferential rate of 15% or 25%, as the case may be, for dividend remittances. Uh, meanwhile, for branch offices, um, 
a 15% uh, branch profit remittance tax is applied to profits that are remitted from the branch to the foreign parent. Now, for any domestic purchase of goods and services, as mentioned earlier, 12% um, input VAT uh, uh, is, in, is imposed. So the input VAT can be used as credits to offset against the 12% output VAT on the sales. And uh, there's also creditable withholding tax, uh, which is, uh, in effect, uh, a tax that is withheld by the purchaser and is an advance payment of the income tax um, earned by uh, the seller of the goods or service. Uh, the purchaser will have to remit that creditable withholding tax uh, to the Bureau of Internal Revenue and would have to file for the corresponding return as well. Um, for importation of goods and services, a final withholding tax of 25% may apply if the exporter is deemed to be doing business in the Philippines through a permanent establishment. So there, is, there are um, nuances as regards the definition of permanent establishment, and this can be seen in the relevant double tax avoidance agreements as well. So um, for importation, 12% um, import VAT is also imposed as well as excise tax, depending on the type of um, of product that is being imported. So these are the taxes that are typically due and owing in the regular course of business. There are also taxes due on special transactions. So for share transfers, which I mentioned earlier, can be um, quite tedious. Uh, there are 15% capital gains tax on the net capital gain, as well as documentary stamp taxes at a rate of 1.5 pesos for every 200 pesos. So uh, there should be proof of payment of such taxes as well as uh, certain documentation, which should be approved by the BIR and the BIR, BIR will then perform a certain uh, mini audit on, the, on those tax payments uh, as well as on the documentation. Uh, that process can um, take place uh, for uh, three months, sometimes a year even. So um, for sale of real property, 6% uh, capital gain, gains tax will apply if the property um, is sold by the business and is, is a capital asset. Otherwise, if it is used in the course of regular trade or business or is an ordinary asset, it will be subject to withholding tax at graduated rates as well as 12% VAT. So there's a very technical definition of um, what a capital asset is versus uh, an ordinary asset, which I will not uh, belabor on today. Uh, in either case, documentary stamp tax at a rate of 1.5% will be imposed. Documentary stamp taxes are also imposed on leases, uh, as well as uh, there's also 12% VAT and 5% creditable withholding tax. And donations of real property are also subject to 6% donors tax. But uh, there are tax and fiscal incentives um, in the next slide. So next slide, please. Yeah. So now the corporate uh, recovery and tax incentives for enterprises or create law has set forth a menu of uh, tax and fiscal incentives, uh, both for exporters and domestic market enterprises under different tiers uh, that are on, in the strategic investment priorities plan. So uh, I, I will not expound on, uh, on these as they, they were already discussed by Attorney Carla Grepo earlier, but I would like to highlight uh, certain things. So for example, uh, for exporters, there can be up to 17 years of incentives in the form of an initial income tax holiday uh, of four to seven years. Uh, and that can be followed by 10 years of a special corporate income tax uh, rate of 5% on, on gross income. And for domestic enterprises, um, the maximum period of incentives would be 12 years. In addition, if a business um, fully relocates uh, from outside Metro Manila uh, or, or within Metro Manila to outside Metro Manila, there can be an additional three years of income tax holiday. So in the next slides, uh, which follow, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide uh, summarizes the various um, 
activities uh, or types of investments which can qualify for tax and fiscal incentives. Um, I will not expound on these in the interest of time. Hence, let's move on to the next slide, please. Yeah, so these are the sample activities as well. And uh, we now move on to our final slide. So this brings the presentation to a close. And once more, thank you, uh, Singapore Business Federation. Technically, thank you for the opportunity to speak. And hopefully, I've imparted some valuable information to parties who are interested in entering the Philippine market. So if you have questions, you may just reach out to SBF. Uh, they can in turn course the questions to me, or you may also write me directly. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie Bev. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's get to the next speaker, Ms. Erika Tan. FTA Education and Outreach. Erika is a part of the FTA team in SPF, uh, Internationalization Policy and Engagement Department. Over to you, Erika. Thank you so much. Erika, you're muted. Oh, we still cannot hear you, everybody. No, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, good. Thank you. Yeah, please continue. Thanks. Okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, um, so um, I hope everyone can give me a few minutes to do a very quick introduction on how you may use uh, Singapore's free trade agreements to help expand your businesses in the Philippines and in the ASEAN region. Well, you won't regret these few minutes, so just bear with me for a while. Okay, next slide, please. So, um, what are exactly our free trade agreements? The standard definition is that FTA is a legally binding agreement between two or more countries to reduce or eliminate barriers to trade and facilitate the cross-border movement of goods and services between them. In practical terms, using FTAs may help you earn more money by increasing your market competitiveness and I am sure no one will reject an opportunity like this. By understanding more about and using FTAs, you may benefit from access to markets with more opportunities, protections, and greater certainty. For those of you who are trading in goods, you may benefit from tariff savings. Um, Ms. Doriboff had mentioned about some of the challenges for foreign businesses in the Philippines, and the good news is certain FTAs may be of help in tackling some of these challenges. Um, next slide. Thank you. Singapore has a wide network of free trade agreements with more than 26 FTAs, and this provides our businesses with market access to various parts of the world. Next slide, thank you. As part of the ASEAN free trade area, both Singapore and the Philippines are strongly committed to creating and accelerating the free movement of goods, services, and investments. These commitments are acknowledged by the ASEAN Trade in Goods Agreement, the ASEAN Trade in Services Agreement, and the ASEAN Comprehensive Investment Agreement. For example, through the ATIGA, Singapore and the Philippines have eliminated their intra-ASEAN import duties for around 99.6% of the tariff lines. So what are some of the other free trade agreements that we have between Singapore and the Philippines? Some examples include ASEAN China, ASEAN Australia New Zealand, ASEAN India, ASEAN Japan, ASEAN Korea, and of course the RCEP. Next slide. So how can FTAs help you so FTAs generally have three major areas, trade in goods, trade in services, and investment. For those of you exporting goods, you will be interested in the trade in goods as it helps to move your goods to more markets at a faster rate while keeping your prices competitive as your importers may benefit from tariff savings. The trade in services and investment chapters in FTAs also offers opportunities for businesses to expand into new markets as well as to protect their interests. Next slide. Companies do not need to use an FTA to export and import goods, but an FTA can provide new benefits to companies. For example, 
so long as it is a covered product and the manufacturer can meet the origin criteria for the product, an applicable FDA actually removes the custom duties that must be paid when goods are imported into a country. For food products, custom duties are quite high. Firms typically pay around 15 to 40% on a wide range of agricultural products. If you are using an FTA, it can actually provide a lower, even zero preferential tariff on qualifying products. This difference can result in a significant cost advantage for companies using FDAs compared to those who do not use FDAs. So to quote an example, a batch of goods with an export value of 500,000 has a custom duty of $150,000 without using an applicable FDA. However, if this batch of goods can meet the rules of origins of Artiga, it can enter the Philippines at a preferential rate of zero. Thus, the custom duty payable is actually zero. As such, the price competitiveness of the goods increases. Well, do not worry if you are now lost on what is rules of origin or what is even Artiga. Just remember that using FDAs may help you earn more money. You can just scan the QR code to download our trade in goods guidebook, and you can always email your questions to us at fta at sbf.org.sg. Okay, now we can move on to trade in services. Uh, next slide. Okay, broadly speaking, under FTA's trade in services chapters, there are actually four modes of services. So mode one is the cross-border services, which consists which consists of uh, services such as telecommunications, postal telemedicine, is distant learning, and e-banking. So mode two, consumption abroad, will be things such as tourism, the hotel and restaurant services. And mode three is actually the commercial presence. Like for example, you can sell a local branch or subsidiary um, in the country, <coughs> in the FTA party countries. And mode four, which um, is quite one of the very common mode, is the movement of natural person. So um, this will actually be like professionals who move over to their country to work. So how do you uh, know that if you can benefit um, from this chapter? So first you actually need to determine uh, what is the relevant FTA for your target market. And then you check if the services you want to provide is actually covered by this FTA. And then um, you have to um, check whether is it a positive or negative list. So do not worry if let's say you are quite lost on this now because you can actually always meet, email us for help. Okay, so um, basically in ASEAN, right, we have the ASEAN Trade and Services Agreement. It actually works towards promoting free flow of trade and services and to reduce restrictions among ASEAN countries in order to improve the efficiency and competitiveness of service providers in ASEAN. So it provides preferential treatment and it provides a predictable operating environment and also requests if that say the companies actually need any help. Uh, next slide. Okay, like what Ms. Laurie Berth had mentioned earlier, Singapore is one of the main foreign investors in the Philippines. So how do the investment chapter in FTAs come into play? Well, the investment chapter in FTAs um, provides a conductive investment environment by providing protection for investors and investments. It also allows for a transparent, facilitative, and secure environment, as well as legal recourse in the event you require it. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, in summary, um, if that's say you have any issues about FDA, we, we, the FDA team at SBF, is here to help you to how to understand and how to use FTAs and internationalize your business. Next slide. Okay, so um, you can actually scan the QR code to sign up for our mailing list and we'll keep you updated on our FTA events. And feel free to uh, email us at FTA at sbf.org.sg to find out more about free trade agreements. Thank you and hope to hear from you soon. Thank you, Erica. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you for, yes, for staying with us, everyone. Yeah, so we'll, we'll have a next poll to get your interest. For whoever wants to be connected with the speaker, please uh, indicate your interest in the poll. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have come to the end of the webinar. Thank you everyone for being here today. The, this is the end of the webinar we have come with for the uh, FYI webinar for Philippines. Hope that you enjoy, learn something from it, 
And most importantly, do check in with us should you require further assistance in your internationalization into the Philippines. See you soon. Stay safe, stay healthy. Have a good, great week ahead. Thank you.